Well, hello, Keto Diet App followers. My name is Nick, Nick Norwitz. I'm a friend and colleague of Martina's and new contributor to the Keto Diet App platform. I'm also a PhD researcher at Oxford in nutrition and metabolism and starting my medical training at Harvard Medical School. Now, I recently got the awesome opportunity to start lecturing the Harvard first year students about nutrition and metabolism. Um, this is obviously something I'm very passionate about, but I see no reason, and Martina sees no reason, to have this information just kind of sit siloed in an ivory tower. Rather, we want to make it accessible to you. So that's what this is. This is lectures being given to Harvard Med students um, who are interested in nutrition and metabolism. Hopefully you find it accessible as well. I tried to uh, lecture in a way such that it wasn't uh, too dense. So hopefully it'll be fun. Let us know your thoughts. Hopefully you enjoy this. If you have any constructive feedback, let me know and I can tailor future lectures so that hopefully you enjoy them if you do enjoy this. Anyway, hope you learned something. The first lecture, which um, I might go back and through record and post if you want, was on um, chocolate and olive oil. And the students voted and they wanted me to talk about counting calories and artificial sweeteners, why all is not what it appears for the second lecture. So um, I'm going to talk for the next 30 minutes about calories and sweeteners and hopefully you learn something and if you like this let Martina know we'll get some feedback and I can do more lectures like this in future. Without further ado, the questions for this little um, lecture are in sequence, how do we measure calories? What really is a calorie? Um, then an evaluation of the calories in, calories out model. Is it actually practical? We're going to talk about an alternative to calories in, calories out. Um, then talk about artificial sweeteners. What are the downsides to artificial sweeteners? If you're going to have artificial sweeteners, which some people choose to do, what are the healthiest? Um, or what are some alternatives to sweeteners altogether? And then finally, the most important question of um, the lecture, can I have my cake and eat it too? So let's start with how do we measure calories? What is a calorie? Have you ever stopped to think about that question? What is a calorie really? Well, a calorie is defined as the amount of energy it takes to heat up one gram of water by one degree Celsius. And that definition comes from how we actually measure calories. So we measure it using the device here shown on the left called a bomb calorimeter. Basically what you do is you take a food item and you place it in this bomb cell. Hopefully you can see my cursor. Um, and then explode the food. So like this banana, you just literally blow it up and heat is released from the explosion and it heats up the surrounding water. And depending on how much the water heats up, well, that will inform the number of, quote, calories that are in the food. So something that heats up the water 200 calories is gonna heat up the water half as much as something that has 400 calories. So that's how we define what a calorie is. And just as an aside, the calories on food labels with a big C denote actually 1,000 little c calories, which is the one gram um, of water heated one degree Celsius definition. So a big C calorie is um, a kilogram of water heated one degree Celsius. But that aside, this is a very simple um, compare and contrast between a bomb calorimeter and, well, your cell. So you can see here the mitochondria um, in orange and then some other metabolic processes going around. Um, the cell image is obviously oversimplified, but I just Include the slide to make the point that the way bomb calorimeters extract energy from food and the way your body extracts energy from food is very different. They operate with very different efficiencies, very different processes. Um, so you can't translate one to the other by any means. Um, but as a case in point, I actually want to go a step back in the process of digestion and, and calorie extraction. To talk not at the cellular level, well, sort of at the cellular level, talk about the microbiome. So... Uh, in the pe previous lecture, I was talking about human heterogeneity and how lots of different people have lots of different microbiomes. So my microbiome is very unique from your microbiome, much more so than our genes, which are a lot more similar. Our microbiomes are enormously distinct, and they influence how we process food, how we get calories from food. And so I want to use an extreme example to make the point, and that is of our relatives, the silverback gorillas, shown here on the left. So you see this baby gorilla, very cute, munching some green. Um, and if you look at the gorilla's diet, they eat a lot of plants, you'd assume they get most of their calories from carbohydrates. As a matter of fact, that is not the case. Gorillas get 60% of their calories from fat. They're almost on a keto diet, which is kind of funny. 
Now, how is this possible? Well, while gorillas only consume about 2.5% of their dietary calories as fat, they have microbiomes in their colon that are specialized for turning fiber, um, which usually people assume to have no calories, from just fiber into short-chain fatty acids. And then those fatty acids enter the gorilla's bloodstream and account for 57.3% of their caloric needs. So you add up the dietary fat, 2.5% plus 57.3%, and you come out at 59.8%. So 60% of a gorilla's calories come from fat, and then the rest are filled by a mix of protein and carbohydrates. Now, true, human beings, well, we're not gorillas, but we're not that far off. We don't have these big colons, which you actually can see in a gorilla by looking at their protruding guts. That's why they have these like rounded protruding guts. It's where their colons are. Ours are much leaner, so, um, well, potentially you can have a six-pack. No, that's not really the reason. But we do have smaller guts um, optimized more for eating animal foods. This has to do with the small intestine to colon ratio. I won't go into it now. But anyway, bottom line, I'm getting off track. Humans can extract calories from fiber. Not as much as gorillas, um, but to some extent. But because of human heterogeneity, because we have different microbiomes, you can't actually assign a caloric value to fiber because different people get different number of calories from fiber. So I love this quote. Variability among individuals and their ability to acquire and utilize this source of energy, that being fiber, precludes assigning a caloric value to dietary fiber. Basically, we can't say how many calories fiber is because people are too distinct in how many calories fiber is to each person. So, for some reason, nutrition labels have decided that fiber has zero calories, which doesn't really make sense to me, but there you go. Now, as we're using this extreme example and running with this thought experiment, I want to get a little goofy. So um, this paper suggested that humans get between 2 and 9% of their calories from fiber, assuming you're eating fiber at a pretty standard intake, say 35 grams of fiber per day. Um, I'd actually have to check on the reference to see how many grams of fiber they were referring to in the diet, but let's just say you have a 2 to 9% span in the calories you're getting from fiber. If you take that 7% span and you scale it to a 2,000 calorie diet, over one day, that is 140 calories. Over one year, that is 51,100 calories, which is equal to about 14.6 pounds of fat if you use the 3,500 calories equals one pound of fat conversion, or if you want to turn the 51,100 calories into sticks of butter. That is 64 sticks of butter, um, just in variation in how your microbiome is processing calories from fiber. Now, that might make Paula Deen happy. It's not going to make your waistline happy. Um, maybe I would have gotten a laugh line there. I'm not sure. We'll find out tomorrow. But anyway, obviously this is an extreme example. I'm not trying to say that fiber makes you fat. It's a lot more complicated. If I had more time, I'd go into the nuances of it. Fiber, I'm not trying to vilify it. I'm just trying to make the general point, using fiber as an example, in the microbiome, that we process food very differently from each other and very, very differently than a bomb calorimeter. So can we measure calories in? Well, bomb calorimetry doesn't represent how our cells process energy. We have very different microbiomes. And even if those factors weren't taken into account, the United States Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, actually allows for a 20% margin of error on nutrition labels. So say you're eating this hot dog. Hopefully you wouldn't, but let's say you would. Um, I discount the bun and the mustard. Let's talk about, I guess, the dog portion. That's 250 calories according to the label, one franc. But based on the margin of error that's allowed, that could be as much as 300 calories. On a 2,000 calorie diet, that margin of error is 400 calories. So if you're counting calories and you want to make a deficit of 400 and you're on a 200 calorie, 2,000 calorie diet, the margin of error is equal to your deficit. So for these three reasons, at minimum, counting calories in is just not practical. But truth be told, counting calories in is the easy portion of the equation. Counting calories out is much, much harder. And that's for lots of reasons. I could make a list of 20. I'm just listing three. Your body temperature varies based on how many calories in you're taking. Um, I want to emphasize, though, something called non-exercise activity thermogenesis, the abbreviation for which is NEAT. Um, now, NEAT people discount, but NEAT activities, and this is things like bouncing your leg, hence the little image here on the top left, um, or just moving around. They're basically motions, little jitters, 
that are separate from the motions of um, particular exercise. So say you want to run. That is exercise activity thermogenesis, distinct from non-exercise activity thermogenesis when maybe you're sitting in a lecture, bouncing your leg, listening to this annoying Nick with a nasally voice lecture at you. That would be neat. Now you can see here um, on the left, so this is total energy expenditure is the y-axis. And you can see that even for more active individuals, NEAT contributes a much higher proportion of calories burned as compared to exercise. NEAT over exercise in terms of calories burned. You might go on a nice bike ride or a run, but honestly, it's the NEAT in terms of just movements that accounts for a bigger um, factor. Now, can you measure calories out from NEAT? Well, that would be difficult. But I want to um, reference this really cool study. I think this is an older study, 19-something, and I think it was in science, so really good journal. Um, and I'm just going to read you excerpts from the abstract because I think they stand on their own. Um, basically, they took 16 non-obese volunteers um, and fed them 1,000 kilocalories, or calories with a big say, per day in excess of their weight maintenance requirements for eight weeks. So let's say you're eating a 2,000 calorie diet to sustain weight. That's saying you instead eat 3,000 calorie, 3, calorie diet for two months, and they wanted to see, okay, do people gain weight? And if they do, to what varying degrees? What they found was that changes in NEAT, these leg bouncy motions, accounted for a tenfold difference in fat storage that occurred and directly predicted resistance to fat gain with overfeeding. Basically, certain people, when they eat more calories, they just upregulate NEAT. So their body burns more calories and they don't gain weight. Now that works in reverse too. People who restrict calories might downregulate NEAT to a greater extent. And so NEAT is a way your body regulates how many calories you burn based on calories in, calories out. So if you try to restrict, your body's going to compensate. If you try to overeat, your body might try to compensate. Or for some people, it might not, and it might lead to weight gain. This is a true study, but I can tell you from personal experimentation and anecdotal evidence, well, my personal experiences uh, agree with this. I've actually tried this experiment on myself, and I'm a person with high NEAT upregulation. I can eat six, 8,000 calories and I really don't gain any weight. I just get really um, jittery, bouncing around all the time. My leg won't stop moving. I can't sleep well, but I don't gain weight. Now, if I did that to my dad, if I even give him 500 calories in excess of what he should eat, I'm pretty sure he'd put on three pounds a week. We just have very different um, metabolisms. So again, human heterogeneity. But let's play devil's advocate. Let's say body temperature is not a factor. Neat's not a factor. And you can measure calories in, calories out perfectly for a day. Then can you use calories in, calories out? Well, really no. And I think this is the most important factor to, to comment on. And that's because your hormones are going to determine how you partition your calories. So if you store those calories, those excess calories, where do they go? Do they go to brain activity, digestion, excretion, body heat? Your hormones determine all that. Let's make it simple and just say, do they go to fat growth or muscle growth? Let's say you, your hormones dictate that those calories, excess calories, are going to fat growth. That's going to lead maybe to an increase in visceral fat. You have more inflammation. You have more metabolic disease. It makes your hormones worse. You get more fat growth, more metabolic disease, and you get this vicious cycle of disease. But what if you're you know, resistance training and you have some extra calories and they go to muscle growth? Well, then you have an increased basal metabolic rate. It could improve your hormonal milieu. And maybe in future you get more muscle, more increased basal metabolic rate, and that sets up a positive cycle where you gain some nice lean mass, and that's healthy. And so in the long term, you might burn more calories and have a you know better health of your weight because of how the, the, the fuel that you eat is partitioned. So maybe over the course of a day or even the course of a week or the course of a month, you can use calories in and calories out and caloric restriction to lose weight. But because of adaptations um, that occur in your body over time, in addition to just fuel partitioning, so we have fuel partitioning here in this slide, but let's talk about microbiome adaptations. I'm going to give another lecture on that, how it screws your microbiome up, how all these things adapt in your body to make it basically futile over the long term. Um, now I'm getting on my soapbox, so I promise to get off of it. Um, after this slide, I have a very strong stance, so I'm not going to hide from it. These are just some of the reasons the calories in, calories out model is impractical. Now I'm not saying calories in, calories out doesn't apply to humans. It's thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, of course, applies to humans. It applies to all physical systems. What I'm saying is it's completely impractical in a real human context because you can't measure calories in and you can't measure calories out, so what's the point? 
Um, and I really like this slide to sum it up. This is how I feel about calories in, calories out, the um, effectiveness of it. So it's a little cartoon. Fed up with how her diet is going, Charlene takes a more serious aim at her weight. You might as well be shooting your scale. So what's an alternative? Well, uh, on the blog I listed four, I think. I'm just going to go over one, and that is glycemic index. So what is glycemic index? Glycemic index is how much a given quantity of food increases your blood sugar. I'm going to distinguish that between glycemic load, which might actually be more important. Glycemic load is how much what you eat increases your blood sugar. So let's say you have a slice of watermelon. Um, that has a glycemic index of 72. If you eat 10 slices of watermelon, it's 10 times the glycemic load, but the same glycemic index. So glycemic index is like density. You can think about it at that. And glycemic load is like mass. So it's, you know. Um, anyway, glycemic index. Let's talk about that more. It's on a scale from 0 to about 100. So 0 is something with no carbs, has a 0 glycemic index, it doesn't spike your blood sugar at all, an egg is not going to spike your blood sugar, um, whereas pure sugar has a glycemic index of 100. Um, I think there are a few things that actually have glycemic indices higher than 100, like maltose, I think it's maltose, um, but let's just talk about a 1 to 100 scale. So points of reference, things like broccoli, a glycemic index of about 15, Watermelon has one of the highest glycemic indices of fruit at about 72. I think bing cherries are pretty low. Um, like blueberries, raspberries, berries are tend, to, tend to be lower in their glycemic index. But those are just some points of reference. Now I want to share a really cool study. So in this study, what they did, is they took 12 men, and they fed them identical diets. In fact, I think it was a crossover study, which means the men were, the same men were fed two diets on separate occasions. I'd have to check that, but I think it was a crossover study. They took, so men are compared to themselves, basically, as comparisons. Every person serves as their own control, eating two different meals. Anyway, what they did in the study is they gave two different meals. Those meals were identical for calories. They were identical for macronutrients. They were identical for taste. Same calories, same energy, same carbohydrates, fats, proteins, taste. The only thing that differed was the glycemic index. And so the scientists basically manipulated the glycemic index of the carbs in these meals so that one was a high GI, high glycemic index meal to spike blood sugar, and the other one was a low glycemic index meal to keep blood sugar lower. Um, and so what happened? Well, you can see here on the graph, the high GI meal, graph A, spiked blood sugar by definition it should, and the low GI meal didn't spike blood sugar as much. Um, then what happened with insulin? Well, insulin is the glucose following hormone. It follows glucose in response to glucose. It's also the fat storing hormone. But you, as you would expect, the high GI meal spiked insulin, and then insulin dropped a lot, and the low GI meal that happened to a lesser extent. So the big spike and the big drop is what we call the insulin roller coaster. Now, what does the insulin roller coaster cause? Well, the spike and drop of insulin tends to cause hunger. Did that happen in this study? Well, yes. So you can see in graph C here on the bottom left, the participants that had the high GI meal were hungrier afterwards, um, presumably forcing them or, or um, compelling them to eat more, say, three or four hours after their meal, after their hunger rating hits like two or three, or really spikes at around four to five hours, you know, every, that's like the three meals a day kind of uh, system. Um, this wasn't just self-reporting by the patients. If you look in the brains of these patients, which they did in the study, you can see this area of the brain light up. This area of the brain is called the nucleus accumbens. It's center of the reward pathway in the limbic system. This is the site that lights up when you have cocaine, when you have sex, anything rewarding. So drugs, sex, and sugar all make the nucleus, nucleus accumbens light up like a flashlight in a dark room. Which begs the question, is sugar physiologically addictive? I would say it is. Um, anyway, I want to say a little bit more about this insulin roller coaster. So when you're on the insulin roller coaster, you're being driven to hunger by... Hormonal fluctuations that really aren't, well, I'm going to get attacked for using this term, but aren't that natural, at least to the degree that we experience them and the frequency we experience them. You have the big spike and drop in insulin, and that causes your brain to think you're hungry when you're really not. So um, at least you're not hungry for nutrients. What I'm trying to say is I want to differentiate hormonal hunger, insulin roller coaster, from true hunger, when your body needs nutrients, needs energy, maybe needs calories. Um, those are two distinct things, and if you're being driven by the insulin roller coaster all the time, you're never going to feel true hunger. So, what would this predict? Well, this would predict, so if I'm saying, all right, 
The insulin roller coaster is driving hormonal hunger, and a hormonal hunger is obscuring true hunger. So you're not eating when you're hungry and your body needs fuel. You're eating because of insulin spikes and drops leading to weight gain. That's what I'm saying. And what that would predict is if you remove the insulin roller coaster, people would just be driven by true hunger and presumably lose weight. Now, to help explain that, I want to use this analogy that I love, is that of a um, gasoline-carrying truck, so this shell truck. And you can see two um, tanks on the truck. Hopefully you can't see my cursor, but if you can't, bottom left, there's this little silver tank that has gasoline in it, at least I think that's what that is, and it's the tank that the truck runs on, maybe the little tank, and the truck has to run for a little while before it goes to the next station, and it itself fuels up while lugging this big hunk of gasoline on the back that it doesn't have access to. Um, which is unfortunate because in a really efficient system, if you're just thinking about the truck as an entity, why would it just draw on this tiny tank of gas when it has this huge tank of gas in the back? And that's kind of like the human body. So the human body, this tiny tank is analogous to the liver. The liver stores carbohydrates that can be released into your bloodstream. And you only have about 450 calories stored as glycogen in your liver that can be released into your bloodstream. There's some more in your muscles, but your muscles are selfish and they hog that. So only 450 calories in sugar stored in your body. However, a relatively lean 70 kilogram person, not even talking about somebody who's overweight or obese, has about 135,000 calories stored as fat. Let that sink in. 450 as carbs, 135,000 as fat, just in fat tissue. So if you can learn to run on that, and if you have excess, if you're obese and have 500,000 calories stored as fat, wh why would you depend on eating every few hours to store, your, like stock up your liver glycogen? Why would this truck have to stop? Why wouldn't you just run on the big source of fuel you have until you run it down, especially if you want to get it run down, say you're overweight or obese? Again, the prediction is remove insulin spikes, remove hormonal hunger, and let the body use its excess until you're at a happy weight point. Does this work? There's a lot of studies I could cite. Um, some great ones by like Finney and Volick, Forsyth et al., 2008, and Lipids. Um, if you're interested in that, go look up some of Steve Finney's lectures on YouTube, the low-carb lectures. He demonstrates the data really nicely, and he's much more eloquent than I am. Um, but I want to share two anecdotes about people I've worked with. I have permission to share these stories, um, and they are just two really amazing people that I want to talk about. So. One is um, a friend of mine. His name is Rohan Kashid. He's helping me and Martina on a book um, we're writing on uh, the new Mediterranean diet, um, low-carb diet. Anyway, um, when I met him, he was pre-diabetic. He had an HbA1c of 6.2. Um, he has a family history of diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. Um, the key to his case was he's a chef. So he's working 16 hours a day in the kitchen. He's the hardest working man I know. And he's a family man, he's a great husband and father, um, and so, you know, if anybody has an excuse to eat stressy and then he's exposed to food all the time, it's this guy. If anybody has an excuse to get overweight, it's this guy. Um, and that happened. He, you can see, um, gained some extra pounds. And when I met him, I, I started working with him. I, I created one rule for him, and that was, let's not spike your insulin. That is the one rule. We're going to do whatever we can to not spike your insulin, which means we're going to cut out carbs. I'm not going to give you calorie restrictions by any means. Eat as much cheese as you want. Eat as many eggs as you want, as much meat, fish, as much oil as you want. I don't really care. You can have some cooked leafy green veg, not too much. Send me pictures of what you're eating so I can monitor you. And all we want to do is stop the insulin spikes. That's it. Eat as many calories as you want. I really don't care. Um, what happened? Uh, within a few days, this is a message you sent me, I can't believe I'm not hungry. I just have no cravings anymore, and my energy is great. He was like the truck. He's pulling the excess calories um, from his extra stores until he's at a healthy weight, and that indeed is what happened. He pulled all, all of his extra, excess calories off, or a lot of them, and became pretty damn lean. So this is him only at two months. He lost like 30, 40 pounds, um, and he's continued to do well as far as I know. Um, this lifestyle is sustainable. You don't get cravings and you just eat when you're hungry. So he just eats when he's hungry. Um, this is another woman. Um, her name is Beatrice. I met her through some of my studies in Parkinson's disease. She has Parkinson's disease and she's, um, or was pre-diabetic. Uh, again, she reversed her pre-diabetes by just stopping the insulin spikes. Lost, you can see she lost a ton of weight, um, is sustaining it. And, um, her hip, which was pretty inflamed, um, her inflammation went down because cutting 
the insulin spikes and the carbs does tend to help with inflammation and oxidative stress well, which can help with chronic disease. Whether or not it helps um, with their course of Parkinson's disease, I really hope it does. It's part of what my research is on. In fact, I'm just recovering. If I'm not speaking too eloquently, I apologize. I'm recovering from submitting a 370-page thesis to my supervisor yesterday, so I'm a bit tired. But anyway, um, now I'm rambling. Another amazing case just of a woman who simply get rid of the insulin spikes and was able to lose a lot of weight. Um, I, I chose to share these two anecdotes rather than uh, a study just because I always like to come back to the, the people behind the data. Remember the plural of anecdotes is data and so when you see these big studies, big numbers, it's really impressive and they're so important. I mean that's what we should be basing our, our you know, guidelines on. But um, it's always important to remember that there are human beings behind these data. Uh, so I, I wanted to share those because I thought they were compelling. I want to transition now into artificial sweeteners. I'm going to just talk about that. I'm going to spend most of the time on calories. I'm going to spend five, ten minutes on artificial sweeteners. So downsides, what are they? Well, we talked about the insulin roller coaster. It turns out most artificial sweeteners, they spike blood sugar and presumably insulin as well, just like sugar. And that presumably would make you eat every few hours, which is, well, not good. So it's going to make you overeat. It makes hyperpalatable food. It puts you on this insulin roller coaster. That's downside one. Downside two, I find even more compelling. This is a great study in Nature, an excellent journal, um, by one of my favorite researchers, um, Aaron Seagal, and his group. And there was a ton of really cool data in the study, but I want to go over one finding in particular, which was that they basically just they took healthy humans who didn't eat artificial sweeteners, and they gave them an artificial sweetener, saccharin. And what they did with these people is they monitored them on oral glucose tolerance tests to see how well they handled sugar in their diet. And what they found was that they gave people sugar, or carbohydrate really, um, after having the saccharin, the majority of people, four out of seven, developed within five days. You can see here on the graph on the left, they had a worse glycemic response. They became glucose intolerant within four to five days of being exposed to artificial sweeteners. Now, this effect was mediated by adverse effects on the microbiome, the bacteria that live in your guts. And they demonstrated this cleverly by taking fecal samples, microbiome samples, from the participants before and after they gave them the artificial sweeteners, and they put those samples into germ-free mice, which are mice without microbiomes of their own. So the mice adopt the microbiomes they are transplanted with. And when the mice were given the microbiomes of the people before the study, it's the black line here on the right, they had a healthy glycemic response. But when they were given the microbiomes of the uh, responders after they were given the saccharin, the mice adopted that poor glycemic response. They had a bigger blood sugar spike to the same amount of sugar, same amount of carbs, because they got the unhealthy microbiome. Now, they weren't exposed to saccharin themselves. They just were transplanted with the microbiome. And what this demonstrates is that artificial sweeteners can mess up the gut microbiome to make you glucose intolerant, which is a predecessor and harbinger of things like metabolic syndrome, obesity, and all sorts of chronic diseases. So artificial sweeteners can really screw up your microbiome. And now it's true, three out of seven people did not respond to the saccharin. So maybe three out of seven people do just fine on saccharin. That's possible. Um, it's up to you whether or not you think it's worth risking it. Personally, I choose not to risk it. Risk it to get the biscuit, literally. <laughs> um, laughing at my own jokes now. Well, I must really be bored. All right, moving on. Artificial sweeteners can screw up neurotransmission. So aspartame is an example. Aspartame is a sweetener in Diet Coke. Aspartame can block the import of neurotransmitter precursors into the brain. So you can hear about things like dopamine and serotonin, which are important for brain function. Also norepinephrine, epinephrine. These have precursors called tyrosine and tryptophan, um, respectively for the catecholamine and indolamine um, neurotransmitters. Um, artificial sweeteners like aspartame can block the import of building blocks for neurotransmitters into the brain can screw up neurochemistry. Then there are also rodent models that show that aspartame can alter activity in the cerebral cortex and the amygdala, which is the fight or flight anger system in the brain. Um, and then the, in humans, there are, are associative studies linking aspartame consumption with behavioral and cognitive problems like learning problems, headaches, seizures, migraine, irritable moods, anxiety, depression, insomnia. Um, so if you take you know, all this together, the mechanism, the animal data, 
and the association studies in humans, I think it makes a strong case that artificial sweeteners screw with neurotransmission. Anyway, all right, I realize now I'm gonna get a little practical. People want sweet, and if they're not gonna have sugar, um, they might rely on artificial sweeteners or sweeteners. So if you're gonna do that, there are two options that I think are probably just fine. And those are erythritol and stevia. The reason I think they're probably just fine is because they're pretty much non-insulinogenic other than the cephalic phase insulin response, which is when you taste anything sweet, you can have a little insulin spike, tiny baby insulin spike, um, just because your body's anticipating something sweet. You know, it wants to prime itself for incoming sugar. Um, so they're thought to be non-insulinogenic. They are thought to have a minimal impact on the microbiome. Erythritol, 95% is absorbed in the small intestine before it gets to the microbiome of the colon. And the 5% that gets there uh, probably isn't fermented by the microbiome anyway. Stevia, there's no evidence for um, negative impact on the microbiome that I am aware of. There are all, also are no um, negative documented side effects on neurotransmission of these two sweeteners. So if you're going to use sweeteners, use one of these two. Swerve is a pretty good brand, at least in the States, for um, like baking as a sugar replacement. Stevia um, is a lot sweeter. I wouldn't use it for baking. Martina can be um, do better at giving you tips for how to use each one. But I would say if you're going to do baking, use erythritol. Um, stevia can be used for like sweetening teas and coffees and stuff like that, or things that are not cooked. Another option, and this is something we leave in our book, is hacking it. Going all, nat going all natural, you don't actually use, need to use sweeteners, you can use just real food. So um, one cool trick you can use is fennel. I love fennel, it's one of my favorite veg uh, because of its like licorice anise flavor. I think it's delicious, it's super sweet. And I think it has like four grams of carbs per 100 gram raw, I think, um, which is really low. Um, and But it still tastes really sweet. And the reason it tastes sweet is because of a compound called anethole. Um, now, anethole or anethol, I think it's potato, potato kind of thing. Um, anethol is perceived by the tongue as 13 times sweeter than sugar. So it's just a compound in plants. There are others that um, is perceived as sweet when it's not actually sweet at all. So you can try cooking with fennel, put some shaved fennel on a salad, something like that. Another option is vanilla. Vanilla are other base flavors, quote. Now, um, what am, I, what am I trying to say here? So vanilla is um, something that is incorporated into a lot of sweet dishes. It's a base flavor in pastries, ice cream, whatever. It's always kind of there. Even if you don't consciously know it's there, your brain picks up on it and it makes associations. Your brain is really good at making associations. And over time, presuming you've had pastries over the course of your life or sweets of some sort, it's probably learned to associate vanilla with sweetness. Same with coconut. Probably it's learned to associate coconut, which itself doesn't have sugar, with sweetness. Um, or not much sugar, at least. And so then when you have these things in isolation, your brain is tricked into perceiving sweetness. So if you put just a little bit of vanilla, say, in your coffee, um, with like a little bit of cacao or something, it might actually taste sweet, even though there's not much sugar there at all. So you can use these hacks, these natural hacks, say fennel or vanilla, to go all natural and, you know, um, taste sweet without using artificial sweeteners, not even stevia, which is actually natural, or erythritol. I blathered on longer than I wanted to. Um, but now for the most important question. Can I have my cake and eat it too? I'm going to leave that as a cliffhanger because the best person to answer that is not me, but the wonderful and beautiful Martina Slaryova. And so go check out her blog, check out her recipes. She has some really brilliant stuff. Well, I hope you enjoyed that and learned something. Let us know your thoughts. We love constructive feedback, and hopefully we can use that feedback to evolve future lectures into something you enjoy even more. Have a good one.